Act One, Part One of Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Charlie's Aunt, a play in three acts by Brandon Thomas. Produced at the Royalty Theatre, London, on December 21st, 1892. Transferred to the Globe Theatre. Original London run, four years. Cast of characters. Stephen Spedicue. Solicitor, Oxford. Read by phone. Colonel Sir Francis Chesney, Baronet. Late Indian Service. Read by Larry Wilson. Jack Chesney, graduate at St. Old's College, Oxford. Read by Tom Daly. Charlie Wickham, graduate at St. Oaks College, Oxford. Read by Vogue and Boss. Lord Fancourt Baberley, graduate at St. Old's College, Oxford. Read by Thomas Peter. Brassett, a college scout. Read by Todd. Dona Lucia Dalvadores, from Brazil. Read by Sonia. Amy Spetigue, Spetigue's niece, read by Lian Yao. Kitty Verdun, Spetigue's ward, read by Beth Thomas. Ella Delahaye, read by T. J. Burns. Stage directions, read by Devora Allen. Oxford, eighteen ninety two. Act one, scene, interior of Jack Chesney's rooms, St. Olds College, Oxford, morning. The walls are oak-panelled, or half-panelled, or plain cream-washed walls with beautiful, low heraldic ceiling and cream, picked out in colour and dull gold. Door opening off, with passage backing, leading to outer door left. Door opening off to bedroom, with light backing, up left. Between doors, an oak sideboard, with cupboard underneath. Large opening and recess with portiere to draw left centre. Long, stone-mullioned, embayed window, right center, with view of quad and practicable center casement, to open off, window seat with four river cushions and one magazine. Long, red, rep fabric curtains. Upright piano center, with pile of music on top, between window and recess. Fireplace right, looking glass, etc., on mantel, low bookcases right and left of it. Saddleback armchair by fire, with white antimacassar. Table center with ashtrays and books and table cover and dark material on it, with two single chairs right and left of it, with sweater over back of left chair. Writing table down right center by fire, with ABC timetable, magazine, and Corona cigar box. Stage cloth. Circular hat stand inside right center corner of recess, with boxing gloves, single sticks, etc. on it. Plaster bust of Plato on pedestal, left corner of room, angle. Clock and photographs of chorus girls and flowers on mantel shelf. More photographs and books on top of bookcases. Pipes, tobacco jars, etc. Prints on walls above. Tray with three tumblers. One square decanter half full of whiskey. One glass jug of water on sideboard. Four champagne bottles. One bottle of claret, open, in sideboard cupboard. Above, on wall left... Groups of rowing eights, football teams. Six dining room chairs arranged as follows. Two right and left of center table. One below door left. One at piano. One left side of writing table. One top right corner by window. Antique furniture, well-worn comfortable chairs. Quad seen through window, and sunlight streams in through window. Curtain music. The Eaton Boating Song. By A. D. E. W. Orchestra plays first sixteen bars with gradual crescendo. Curtain starts to rise. Orchestra plays next sixteen bars more softly, with gradual diminuendo, till music ceases at full rise of curtain. Jack discovered seated at writing table, unlit pipe in mouth, struggling wildly to write a letter. He looks at letter and tears it up. Jack Chesney, tall, dark, good-looking, about twenty-two, wears light-colored lounge suit and college tie, leander pink and white diagonal stripes, 
He laughs his way through life, is self-confident, quick, alert, and must have drive as he sets the pace of the play. I can't. I can't get into the vein. Flings down pen. I don't know what to say. Don't know how to begin. I wish to goodness I'd spoken to her at the dance the other evening. Rises to centre. When she told me they were all going away for the summer. Instead, I've gone and left everything to the very last minute, and now I'm regularly nonplussed. By George, I know what I'll do. I'll make an exercise of it. I'll write it out a dozen different ways and send the one I think looks the best. Goes back to table and sits. Takes up pen. So come on, Jack. Here we are, in love with the dearest girl on earth. Tackle her like a man and tell her so. Or they'll be off north. You'll be gone down and have lost your chance for ever. She's my fate, and I'm hanged if I shan't be hers. So here goes. Writing. My darling. Stops. Rather strong, perhaps, to begin with. Tears up paper, places on left of writing table, begins again. My dear Miss Verdun. Stops again. No, too formal, and not a bit what I really feel. Tears that up. My dear... Hang it, why not? Writes boldly. My dear Kitty, that's grand. Brassett enters quietly door up left to table center. Brassett, college scout, manservant, between forty and fifty years of age. Wears dark trousers and short dark gray alpaca coat, white collar and dark tie. He is always polite and never familiar in his manner. Now I can go ahead like a house on fire. Looking proudly at letter. My dear Kitty, I... I beg pardon, sir, but would you mind? Yes, very much. Go away. I'm busy. Yes, sir, but... I'm busy with the most important affair. Get out. Brassett, raising book or two off table and hesitating. Yes, sir. Jack aside. Just as I'd made such a good start, too. At letter again. My dear Kitty... Brassett calmly drops books back onto table. What are you doing, Brassett? Confound it all. What do you want? I merely wish to say, sir, that I have laid out a few things which... All right. Thank you. Get out and leave me alone. Which I thought you wouldn't care to... Jack, in despair. Take em, keep em. Take every blessed rag I've got. Only go away. Brassett goes to door, up left. Jack at letter again, savagely. My dear Kitty. Brassett at door. Beg pardon, sir? Confound it, I wasn't addressing you. Go away. Exit Brassett up left quickly. Enter Charlie, left, with letter. Come center. Charles Wykeham is about twenty. Good-looking, medium height, fair, Saxon type. Charming, and though shy is not awkward. Rowing type. Wears white flannels, blazer and muffler, cheap watch and breast pocket of blazer, with short chain hanging out. For later entrance with telegram, has changed blazer for a lounge suit coat, removed muffler, and wears a collar and tie. My dear Kitty. Charlie, mildly. I say. Jack, throwing down pen, jumping up savagely. If you don't clear out, Brassett, I... Meets Charlie center. Oh. It's you, Charlie. What is it, old chap? Nothing, Jack. I don't want to interrupt you if you are busy. Going. Jack, going center. It's all right, Charlie. Don't go. It's only that fool Brassett. What's he doing? Only bagging all my clothes because I'm going down and worrying me like old Harry while I'm trying to write a most important letter. Moving towards table right. Don't mind me today. I'm nervous and naggy and nonplussed. Sits on end of table, right center. And so am I, Jack. Why? I've been trying to write a letter to... A letter? To whom? To... to Miss Pettigrew. Jack, going to Charlie center. How far have you got? Charlie brightening. Oh, I began awfully well, but I didn't want to be too uh, distant... 
and I didn't like to be too, too familiar. Well, so I just said, my dear Amy, and then words failed me, and I've come to you for advice. You always know what to say and do. Jack, dubiously, with a look towards letter. Oh, do I? You know my idiotic complaint. I'm shy, and you're not. Aren't I? So prescribe for me, old chap. What am I to say? Turning away left, sits right corner of table center. Jack, going right center, aside. A good idea. I'll prescribe for him and take the medicine myself. Sits at writing table, right. Gets paper, etc. Energetically. Now then, let's see. You're in love with Amy Spettigue, and you want to know if there's any hope for you. And if so... You see, they're all off to Scotland tomorrow. Yes, I know, and you want to see her at once. When and where, Bearer waits. Do I diagnose the case accurately? To a T, old chap. Very well, then. You'll want to say something to this effect. Writing. My dear Kitty. Stops dead. Charlie going to him. Writing table, right center. No, not Kitty. Amy. Oh, of course. Uh, what am I thinking of? Tears up paper. Takes fresh sheet. In casual, glib tone, writing. My dearest Amy, forgive me, darling, for thus addressing you, but I love you so deeply, underlined. Charlie, surprised, moving nearer, interrupting. Rather strong, Jack. Shut up. So earnestly, also underlined. Oh, I say. Turning away, center. That I must write and tell you so. All I ask is... Charlie sits, table, center. But there is one obstacle to my putting it quite as straight as that, much as I'd like to. What's that? Well, er, uh, I have an aunt. My dear Charlie, most of us have. What about her? I feel I ought to tell her first. Jack flings down pen, rises and goes to fireplace. Oh, if you're going to drag an aunt into the business, we may as well wait till they all come back from Scotland. Why? You know what auntie is when she steps in. No, I don't. That's just it. I don't know her. I never even seen her. Well, we won't be too hard on that, aunt. She hasn't interfered much in your affairs up to now. Well, except to find out that I was an orphan and have me sent to Eton and to Oxford, and now my guardian writes to me that she's coming here this morning by an early train and will take a luncheon with me at one o'clock. Jack, coming down to back of chair left of writing table. And you've never seen her? No, she went out to Brazil when I was born and became a sort of secretary to a very rich old Brazilian chap out there called Dom Pedro Dalvadores. And now, by the merest accident in the world... Taking truth from pocket, and pointing to marked paragraph. I've seen this. Gives Jack paper. Jack going down right. Note. Lucia is pronounced Lucia. Portuguese, not Spanish. Reading. Madam, or rather, Dona Lucia Dalvadores, the Brazilian millionaire who has taken Lord Toppleby's magnificent mansion in Belgravia, is an English woman of genial disposition and a financial genius. Indeed, it was her capacity in this direction that earned the gratitude of her late husband and led to a romantic deathbed marriage. To Charlie. Well, I don't see much in that. Offering paper back. Go on, Jack. Read the next. Jack, reading. Her only relation is a nephew at Oxford. Lucky nephew. That's me. By George, Charlie, this is a startler. Throws paper to Charlie. And she may be here any minute. Goes to mantelpiece, looks at clock. I've met all the trains up to now. I wish she'd have come some other day. Rises, moves away down left a little. Jack, turning, looks at clock. She'll arrive by the next, just in time for lunch. Charlie, dolefully. Yeah, it's a bore. 
I wanted to write that letter to Amy. Jack sits on table right center, thinking. I don't know so much about that. But it's an awfully difficult letter to write, fearfully complicated. Why? Well, you see, I've no people or anything. No people with an aunt like that? Pointing to paper which is in Charlie's hand. But I have no reason to expect anything from her, more than she has already done for me, for which, of course, I am very grateful, and all that. But I want to see Amy, and put it to her that if— Jack, suddenly, coming center to Charlie. Charlie, I've got a clinking good idea. Charlie, pushing Jack towards writing table, gratefully. <laughs> Jack— you're a good chap. Write it down and I will copy it out. Jack, stopping him. No, not for you, for me, for us both. You're gone on Amy, I'm in love with Kitty. Really? Jack? Madly, worse than anything I ever took up, even cricket. I was writing to tell her so when you came in. Pointing. There's the letter. Charlie, wringing Jack's hand with effusion. I'm so glad. And what's your idea? Hang letter writing. We'll give a luncheon party for your aunt. Tea afterwards in the garden. In the garden? Yes, I'll get leave. But my rooms are so small. Never mind, I'll lend you mine. Pushing Charlie towards writing table chair, center. Brassett shall see to it. Calling towards left. Brassett? To Charlie. Now come on. First, we'll ask the girls. Ask the girls? Standing behind writing table. Jack, by chair, left of writing table. To meet your aunt. What about old Spettigue? Blow old Spettigue. Oh, I forgot. He's up in town for a few days on business. Sits at writing table. So much the better. Brassard. Do you think they will come? They'll jump at it. What makes you think so? Well, what do you think? Why, Jack, you know, I rather agree with you. We'll send a note at once. You write it. Go ahead. Charlie writes to dictation. My dear Miss Spettigue. Calling. Brassett, where are you? Brassett up left and comes down left of Jack. Where are you? Turns. Sees Brassett standing left. Oh, uh... Brassett, uh, get someone to take a note to Mr. Spettigue's. Yes, sir. Exit left. Yes, Jack, I've got that. Jack gets envelope, pen, and book to write on. Would you and Miss Verdun? Puts foot on chair left of writing table and puts cigar box on knee to write on. Do me the honor. Charlie repeating. The honor. To lunch with me and Mr. Chesney. Mr. Chesney? I'll address the envelope. Charlie, still repeating, while dipping pen in ink. I'll address the... Jack, breaking in before Charlie can write it. No, not that, you muff. At his rooms, St. Old's College, today at one o'clock. Addressing envelope. Miss... Spettigue? Miss... About to write. Jack stops him before he writes. No. Look out. To meet my aunt... Uh, what did you say her name was, Charlie? Donna Lucia Dalvadores. Donna. All right, stick it down. An answer by bearer will greatly oblige. Blot's envelope. Charlie writing. Yours... Sincerely, Charles Wickham. Blots and folds letter. Splendid, Jack. You are a genius. Hands letter to Jack. Jack takes letter, puts it in envelope, and closes it. It's a glorious opportunity. They're off to Scotland. And we're off down. And now we shall have them all to ourselves. Re-enter Brassett. Left. The messenger, sir. Jack gives letter to Brassett. Give him that, and tell him to look sharp. Turns back slowly to Charlie. Yes, sir. 
going left. At door, quick glance at address on envelope. Smiles and exits left. Jack, returning to table, takes up torn letters. This sort of thing is not to be settled by correspondence. Tears up letters, gives fragments to Charlie, who puts them into paper basket. No, and we shall have them all to ourselves. Yes, and we couldn't have asked them if it hadn't been for your aunt. I'm beginning to love that dear old lady already. Calling. Brassett. Re-enter Brassett, left. Yes, sir. Lunch for five. For how many, sir? For five. Going to him. For five, sir. Laughs quietly. Charlie rises and goes over to them. Jack to Brassett. What are you laughing at? Well, sir, I'm afraid our credit in the kitchen is somewhat e exhausted. Jack to Brassett. Oh, is it? Turning to Charlie. How are you all for tick, Charlie? Well, Jack, I'm afraid my guardian's rather... Oh, is he? Never mind, Brassett. Get it outside. Go to Bunter's. Brassett, shaking head doubtfully. I'm afraid, sir. We owe Bunter's. Oh, do we? Turns to Charlie and sees his watch chain. Uh, Charlie, you don't mind. Takes watch and chain off Charlie. It'll be all right when my check comes. Gives them to Brassett. Here you are, Brassett. Do the best you can with that. Brassett taking them and looking at watch critically. This is no good, sir. I couldn't get anything on this, sir. Hands it back to Jack. However, sir, I've no doubt it will be all right at Bunter's, if I say it's for me. Goes behind table center. Charlie goes to chair left of writing table and sits. Jack laughing. Oh, all right, Brassett. Lunch for five at one o'clock. Goes down left. Brassett looks at own gold watch. Rather short notice, sir. Takes books off table center and puts them on sideboard left. All right. Long pay. Go where you like. Do what you like. Only lunch for five at one. Putting watch and chain in his own waistcoat pocket. Crossing to Charlie. That's all right, Charlie, isn't it? Charlie to Jack. I say, Jack. Taking watch and chain. That's my watch. I beg your pardon, old chap, my mistake. Brassett at sideboard. What wine, sir? Champagne. Brassett sulkily. Very little left, sir. Open sideboard. Half a dozen bottles. Brassett imperturbably. No, sir, I think not. Getting out four from sideboard cupboard. Only four, sir. Puts them on sideboard. Oh, quite enough. Jack to Brassett aggressively. Six, I'll swear. Pardon me, sir. Only four of champagne. Puts them on table center. And I think... Taking out bottle of opened claret. Yes, one of claret. Holding it up. Oh, hang that claret. Brassett puts it on sideboard. It's been open a month. All right. Aside to Charlie. He sneaked those other two bottles. He's a corker. Brassett comes down left center. My fellow's just the same. Jack gives ferocious glance at Brassett, who returns it imperturbably. They all are. Brassett exits left. Now, while you and your dear old aunt are looking at the chapel and the cloisters, Kitty and I can have our little talk. Yes, Jack, that's all very well. But what about Amy and me and our little talk? She'll be in our way horribly. I never thought of that. She's all very well as an excuse to get the girls to come here. But by herself, she'll be an awful bore. She'll be worse than that. She'll be a brute of a nuisance. Sits on table center. And what shall we do? Well... Napoleon went over the Alps on horseback, and I've been under them by train, so there must be a way out of this. But how? Can we ask someone to meet her? Yes, someone we can depend upon. Re-enter Brassett, left. Busies himself at sideboard. But whom? Jack sees Brassett, aside to Charlie. What about Brassett? 
He's a pompous sort of chap, and as artful as a corkscrew. Can't we turn him into a don or something for the day? Charlie, dubiously. Yes, that's a good idea, Jack. But... Jack, after another look at Brasset. No, won't do. We shall want him to wait at table. Oh, of course. So we shall. There's Freddy Peel. Oh, he's such a cynical chap. Brasset exits through recess up left. Jack sits again on table center. Besides, he'd neglect your aunt. Yes, and want to make love to our girls. Jack, suddenly. By George, I've got it. Babs, Fanny Babs, we'll ask him. Oh, yes. Why didn't we think of him before? He's a jolly, cheerful little chap. We'll amuse your aunt like the deuce and keep her in a rattling good humour. Charlie comes to Jack. Splendid. Brasset. Brasset re-enters. Comes down left centre. Yes, sir? Go to Lord Fancourt Babbley's rooms, give him my compliments, and ask him to come here at once. Yes, sir. Goes to door left. Charlie crossing left to Brasset. Sigh, it's very important. Brasset as he goes. Yes, sir. Exits left. Jack shouting after Brasset. And very immediate. Brasset speaks off. Yes, sir. Jack crossing to fireplace. And while Babs is doing gooseberry with your aunt, we can have our chat with the girls. Charlie sits on table center. By the by, Jack, talking of Babs' cheerfulness, haven't you noticed something about him lately? Ever since he was so ill and had to go off to the Mediterranean? I've noticed he's been jolly hard up. Sits in chair back of writing table. I fancy from a few hints he'd drop to me that he's a bit hard hit himself. What? Babs in love? Yes, and if I'm not much mistaken, he's as soft hearted over a girl as. We are. All the better. He'll feel for us. He'll see the necessity, then, of keeping the old lady well out of the way. By George, Jack, you'll be Prime Minister one of these days. Re-enter Brasset, left. His lordship's compliments, sir, and he says he can't come. He has a luncheon party. And could you lend him a few bottles of champagne? Jack, rising. Lend him a few bottles of champagne. Well, of all the cheek. Charlie seated on center table. Who's he got coming? Jack, right center, angrily. Oh, Freddy Peel, and a lot of idiots like himself, I expect. And they'll be howling comic songs all the afternoon. Yes. It'll sound awfully bad, won't it? He mustn't. Crossing left center to Brasset. Here, Brasset, lay for six. Comes to Charlie. Yes, sir. Gets to back of table center. Moves books to piano at back. What shall we do? Going to Jack. Jack at door left, taking Charlie with him. Come on, we'll go to him. We must make him come. He can't upset all our plans in this selfish way. Puts Charlie across to left. To Brasset. Put that champagne in ice, Brasset, and tidy up my room. Come on, Charlie. Come on. Exeunt Charlie. Propelled by Jack, left. Brasset, annoyed. One o'clock. Looks helplessly at watch. Put room in order first. Always the way. Opens windows wider. Picks up book from window seat. Hurry, scurry, no time for anything. They come with a bang, they go with a bang. Everything with a bang. Except pay their bills with a bang. At door, up left. Looking at champagne ruefully. Well, I did think that little perquisite was safe. Upon my word, I did. Exits up left. Lord Fancourt calling off right. Jack, I say, Jack, old man. Lord Fancourt Baberly. He is small, about five foot three to five foot six at most. Good looking, humorous face, smartly dressed in light gray peppercorn suit with waistcoat and black elastic-sided boots. 
He only removes his coat when he gets into the ant's dress. The suit must be light to show up well against the black petticoat and its elastic braces. The essential thing to bear in mind when he is impersonating the ant is that Lord Fancourt has never acted in his life before, or worn women's clothes. He still walks, talks, and moves like a man, and never attempts to act the woman. No effeminate female impersonation business. He tries to lighten his voice when he is first introduced, and it cracks appallingly. After that he speaks naturally, but being careful not to use the deep tones of his voice except to Jack, Charlie, and Brassett, who know who he really is, or again when he forgets he is supposed to be a woman. He just looks a nice old lady of the Victorian era. Lord Fancourt Baberly appears at window, up right centre, carrying large Gladstone bag. Climbing in at window. Where the dickens are you? Looks hurriedly in bedroom, up left. I wanted to borrow some fizz. Goes to cabinet left. I wonder where they keep it. Turns and sees champagne on centre table. Hello. By George, the very thing. Puts bag on table and opens it. Starts wrapping up first bottle with antimacassar from chair right. Serves him right. He shouldn't leave it about. Puts first bottle in bag. In this ostentatious way. Puts second bottle in bag, wrapping third bottle with another antimacassar or scarf from chair left. When I'm so beastly hard up. Puts third bottle in bag. Won't they be jolly waxy? Puts fourth bottle in bag and closing bag. That's a bottle apiece. Come center with bag. And they must make out with whiskey and soda. Going left. Enter Jack and Charlie, left. They meet Lord Fancourt at door and bring him back to center. Charlie left of him, Jack right of him. Hello, Babs. Takes bag from Lord Fancourt, puts it on table center. We've just been over to your rooms to find you. We've been talking about you. No, really. To Jack. I say, how do you think I'm looking? Splendid, old chap. Yes, I thought you'd be pleased with me. Takes bag and bolts towards left. Well, ta-ta. Charlie stops him at door left. They bring him back as before. Jack takes bag from Lord Fancourt and puts it on table center. Don't go, Babs. You wanted to see us, didn't you? All three down center as before. Oh, yes. I wanted to borrow some fizz, but... Sorry, I can't. I could have spared you a couple of bottles, but that fool Brassett. I know. My fellow's just the same. There's no reasoning with him, is there? Well, ta-ta. Makes a feint to bolt. Jack and Charlie miss him and land on center table over bag. Lord Fancourt grins. Jack comes down right to Lord Fancourt, center. I looked you up last night, Babs, but you were out. Charlie comes down left. Lord Fancourt, center. Yes. You know Freddy Peel, don't you? He's an awful idiot. Hasn't a particle of brains, has he? Mm, but I'm all right. He gave a card party last night, and I won a hundred pounds from him. You should have seen his face. <laughs> it makes me laugh now. Why, Freddy Peel hasn't sixpence. No, really? And did he pay you? No, but he's going to. When his grandmother dies. Why, the old lady's been dead years. No, really? That's beastly. You know, I'm stumped. And he's had an awful lot out of me. But he's an awful idiot. Hasn't a particle of brains, has he? But I'm all right. Picks up bag. Ta-ta. I'm off. Attempts to bolt towards window. Jack intercepts and brings him back to table as before. Jack puts bag on table. I say, Babs, we want you to stay and lunch with us today. I say, you chaps, don't play the giddy goat. I've got to meet my tutor. Jack, with mock concern. Babs, you mustn't work like this. You're looking quite pulled down. Am I really? Turns to Charlie. I was only telling Jack so just now. Do you think I shall die? Turns to Jack. Not you. 
You don't want to worry over all this study? You'll be a great man of one sort or another, one of these days without all that. Well, that's what I think, you know. But I ought to do something. We've had a wonderful lot of Johnnies in our family. Great Johnnies in the army and navy and things. I'll bet they never killed themselves with study. No, but I must do something. Of course, Babs, you must stay to lunch. Charlie's aunt is going to pay him a visit. No, really? What fun! I know Charlie visits his uncle sometimes when he is hard up. Pulling Charlie's watch out by the chain. So it's only right his aunt should return the visit. All left, pushing Lord Fancourt to and fro. Charlie regains his watch. Now that's just the sort of thing we want, a jolly smart chap like you, with a fund of humour and a lot of brilliant conversation. Turns Lord Fancourt round so that they face each other. Yes, Babs, that's it. Hands on Lord Fancourt's shoulders and turns him round, same as Jack has done, so that they face each other. Jack pulls him back, facing centre. To interest and amuse a charming lady. Yes. Who is she? Why, Charlie's aunt. What's she like? Well, you see, Babs, we don't quite know. I am to see her today for the first time. I say, Charlie, she may turn out to be an awful old croc. Note, croc, short for crocodile. This was a slang expression of 1892. The modern equivalent would be frump. She's a widow, and a millionaire, that's enough, isn't it? Rather. To Charlie. Put me down for a chance, Charlie. I'll take a chance. We didn't care to ask Freddy Peel, did we, Charlie? No. No? No. He's an awful idiot. I say, uh, what's her name? Donna Lucia Delvadores. Oh, damn it, what a name. Sees his bag again and bolts to door left. Jack and Charlie bring him back, right centre, turn him round and run him up to table, centre, on which he falls face downwards, putting bag on table. Jack brings him down centre again. Uh, look here, Babs, it's no use. You must stay to lunch. You'll find Charlie's aunt a charming old lady. Charming old lady? I say, look here. Haven't you got anything younger coming? Oh, yes. Do other ladies? Nice. Young? Yes. Ah, that's more in my line. How many did you say? Two. Oh, I see. One for each of you, and the old crock for me. No, thanks. I'm off. Lord Fancourt bolts upright of table centre, towards window with his bag, and is brought back as before. Jack, coming down right of him. Now listen, Babs, this is an awfully serious affair. I should think so, with an old crock like that. Charlie, coming down left of him. And we want your help as a friend. Yes, Babs, a friend we can trust, eh? Rather. We'll take you into our confidence. No humbug, straight as a die. We're in love. What, Charlie as well? You silly ass. Pushes him away, sits on table, center. Charlie goes down left. No fool of a flirtation business, but the real downright serious thing. Sits on corner of writing table. And Babs, if you knew the girls as well as we do, you wouldn't wonder at it. And they're coming here to lunch today. I say, have you proposed? From one to the other. No, that's just it. Oh, I see. You want me to propose for you? No, we'll do that for ourselves. That's why we've asked them to come. You know, Babs, you don't understand our feelings a bit. Oh, don't I, though? I say. Rises, comes down centre, beckons boys to him. All centre. Haven't you noticed how sad I've been lately? Yes. What is it? Well, I don't know. But I think I'm in love, too. What makes you think that? I'm always wanting to be alone and hear the birds sing. Jack and Charlie laugh. And I'm getting so fond of poetry. 
I can't sleep. I took to drink for a couple of days, but it made me ill for a week, so I left it off. You've got all the symptoms. Sit down and tell us all about it. Lord Fancourt goes to chair right of table centre. Charlie sits on table centre. Jack sits at table right. Lord Fancourt places his hat on Charlie's foot. Charlie removes it. You remember when I was ploughed? Beastly shame. No, not last time. The term before. I was awfully ill, and took the yacht round the Mediterranean. And at Monte Carlo I came across an English officer named Delay, Quite penniless and dying. You know, Jack, he tried to commit suicide. Bad luck at the tables, eh? Yes. He'd beggared himself and his only child. The sweetest little girl you ever saw, Jack. And to amuse him and keep his spirits up, I used to play cards with him. And what became of him? <sighs> he died, poor fellow. And what became of her, the sweetest little girl you ever saw? I lost sight of her. A lady travelling home that way, from South America, I believe, took charge of her and brought her to England. You know, Jack, I tried to tell her that. You loved her? But she was in such grief that... It all oozed out of your fingertips and the points of your hair. But after all, you know, I might have been rejected, and I should have looked a silly ass. At any rate, you can sympathize with us. Brassett, knock off stage left. Enter up left. Hello, here's the messenger back. Jack, Lord Fancourt, and Charlie all hurry across left. Brassett re-enters with note, hands it to Jack, and goes up left to sideboard. Quietly arranges three tumblers, whiskey decanter, and jug of water on tray during next scene. Jack opens letter and reads. They're coming. They are looking over each other's shoulders while Jack opens note. Lord Fancourt takes note from Jack. By Jove! Charlie takes it from him. Lord Fancourt is left staring at his thumb and first two fingers spread out. So they are... Goes right and sits in writing chair with his back to Jack and Lord Fancourt, reading letter. You'll stop, Babs? Oh, I say. Look here. Looks at clothes. No, you'll do as you are. We won't let you go now we've got you. But look here, Jack. Don't play the giddy goat. I've something else to do. What is it? It's something awfully important. Well, what? I'm going to play in some amateur theatricals. Rot. He'll be ploughed again, won't he, Charlie? But I've given my word. What are you playing? A uh, lady. An old lady. And I've never acted in my life before. Oh, that's his tutor, eh, Charlie? And I'm going to try on the things before those fellows come. You can try them on here. Where are they? In my rooms. In a box on the bed. But... Brassett at sideboard. Jack to Brassett. Fetch them, Brassett, quick. Brassett exits left. Charlie goes up to window. No, I'll fetch them with my little bag. Bolts left with bag. Jack intercepts him. They struggle for bag. Jack gets it and throws it casually down on table. Lord Fancourt picks it up very concerned, takes a step or two down and shakes bag gently to hear if any bottles are broken, then runs hand underneath to see if any are leaking. Reassured, puts bag on chair left of center table. Neither Jack nor Charlie sees any of Lord Fancourt's business with bag. Jack, during this, gets whiskey, water and glasses on silver front sideboard, places them on center table. Charlie coming down right to center table. Jack behind center table. Lord Fancourt left of table. Jack pours out two whiskies, hands decanter to Charlie. Charlie, pouring out whiskey for himself, leaving decanter on right corner of table. Babs, you don't sympathize with us a bit. Jack pours water into one whiskey. Don't either. I only wish I could see my own little girl. Jack adding water to second whiskey. Oh, she'll turn up one of these days. Offers drink to Lord Fancourt. Have a drink? Charlie adds water to his own whiskey. No, I've knocked it off. Just a small one. I'm teetotal. Oh, very well. Here you are, Charlie. Offers glass to Charlie. 
All right, I'll have it. Seizes glass. I tell you what we'll do. We'll drink her health wherever she is. Here's to the future Lady Fancourt Babberley. Uh, what did you say her name was? Haven't the slightest idea. Jack and Charlie laugh. Go on with you. Lifts his glass. Miss Delahaye. They drink. Lord Fancourt places his glass on table. Re-enter Brasset with dress box, left. A large brown cardboard box with gilt edges, like an exaggerated chocolate box. Your things, my lord. Charlie goes down right, sits chair side of writing table. Jack goes right center, front of center table. Lord Fancourt, taking box from Brasset. Thank you, Brasset. You're an awfully good chap. Crosses to Jack, aside. I say, Jack, could you lend me half a crown? Turns up stage and puts box on window seat at back. Jack feels in pockets, then aside to Charlie. Charlie, have you half a crown? Charlie, pulling out linings of trouser pockets. No, Jack, I haven't. Jack, crossing left, aside to Brasset. Brasset, give me half a crown, will you? Yes, sir. Takes out handful of money, gives half a crown. Babs? Lord Fancourt comes down right center, aside to Lord Fancourt. Here you are. Gives half crown and crosses to Charlie right. Thanks. Crosses to Brasset left. Brasset, here you are. Jack and Charlie see half crown given back to Brasset and laugh. Charlie collapses in chair left of writing table. Jack ditto into chair right of table. Lord Fancourt turns, puzzled, crosses to Jack. Jack whispers to him, points to Brasset, then twice to himself, then to Lord Fancourt, and then to Brasset again. Lord Fancourt joins in laughter and goes up to window seat and picks up dress box. Brasset, during this, removes bag from chair left of table to chair at back and exits up left. Jack to Lord Fancourt, pointing to box. What have you got there? Chocolates. Chocolates? Still seated in chair. Let's have a look. No. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll try them on after lunch while you're all in the garden. You can't do that. We shall want you with us. Try them on now. Won't take long, will it? Only a minute or two. Lifts box onto his left shoulder, crossing up stage to left. I've lost an awful lot of time over these theatricals. At door. But next term I mean to work. Exits up left. End of Act One, Part One. Act One, Part Two of Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Charlie's Aunt, a play in three acts. By Brandon Thomas. Act One, Part Two. Jack goes up to front of fireplace. Kitty, off. Oh, yes, here it is. Here's the name. Amy, off. Oh, so it is. Mr. Chesney. I wonder if they're in. Off stage knock. Jack, to Charlie at chair. Here they are, and your aunt's not come yet. Rushes to mantelpiece to see the time. Notices photographs, slants them face down, arranges tie, smooths hair all in a hurry, returns below table, center. Charlie rises, getting behind Jack. Good gracious, what shall we do? Also trying to see in mirror. Re-enter Brasset, up left. Goes to door left. Oh, let them come in, we can explain. Crossing left center below table. Show them in, Brasset. Brasset opens door, showing in Kitty and Amy, closes door, and goes up back center, and then exits up left. Jack shaking hands with Kitty. How do you do? Shaking hands with Amy. So kind of you to come. Oh, we were very pleased to be able to come. They both cross to table right. Charlie joins Amy left. Weren't we, Amy? Oh, yes. To Charlie. Mr. Wickham, are we to Raleigh? Oh, no, no. They shake hands and move up to center table together. Charlie, in his nervousness, backs into the chair, 
then offers it to Amy. She sits, chair left of table. Yes, Mr. Chesney, you didn't mention any time. Jack gives chair. Kitty sits left of writing table. Oh, not at all, not at all. We're delighted. Going to fireplace to look at clock. Aside. She'll be here soon. Enter Lord Fancourt up left in his shirt sleeves to centre up stage, sees girls and bolts back up left. Jack and Charlie in terror the girls may see him. Charlie from behind table leans over table, hides the drink, etc., with his hat on table. Brassett takes tray from table and off through recess up left, leaving whiskey decanter. Charlie leans forward talking to Amy and screening whiskey with his hat, at the same time signaling with his hand behind his back to Jack. Kitty, sitting. And this is where you think and study and do all your work and everything. Jack rapidly takes decanter from table, hides it in fireplace, and returns to chair behind writing table. Oh, yes, we do a lot of that sort of thing here. Sits. You've jolly quarters here. Jack and Kitty continue to talk aside. Charlie to Amy. I am so glad you were able to come here today. You are off to Scotland tomorrow, and we shall miss you so much. Yes, Uncle always takes us to some dreadfully remote place at this time of the year, where we never see a soul, and it's so dreary. Why does he? I don't know. Oh, it's a shame. Why? Are you sorry we're going? Sorry? Why, it's put me and Jack into a perfect fever... That's why we were so anxious to see you here today. It's lucky Uncle is away in town, or I don't think we could have come. Why? I don't know, but he always raises such odd objections. And then you know he's so peculiar with Kitty. Why? She's an heiress, you know, and he's her guardian. They talk aside. Jack ardently. Miss Verdun. Have you forgotten that dance the other night? I never shall. No. No. Those stolen moments in the garden by ourselves were the very happiest of all my life. And out there in the moonlight, ah, moonlight is the true atmosphere for, uh, for sentiment. I wonder how many people have said that. Jack, let down a little. Kitty, I know when you like you can be an awful plague. But today you are quite cynical. I know I am. I'm thinking of that man. Of what man? Of my guardian, Mr. Spettigue, who hurries us away from all our best friends directly we get to know anyone really well, for fear of... For fear of what? Kitty, evasively. Oh, I don't know. Why does he? Kitty looking up and smiling. Because he's a selfish, wicked old man. Are you really so sorry to go away? No, I'm angry. But don't speak about it any more, or as Amy says, I shall cry. Amy, rising and speaking to Charlie as they come down left a little. What a dear, sweet old lady your aunt must be, Mr. Wickham. I am longing to know her. Where is she? Charlie, aside. Jack? Rapidly, in agonized aside and beckoning Jack, who goes to him. Where's my aunt? Jack whispers something in his ear and turns away. Charlie not catching it. What? Jack shrugs shoulders hopelessly and returns to Kitty. Kitty and Amy see nothing of this last scene, which must be played rapidly. Charlie to Amy hesitatingly. Oh, well, uh, she's hardly arrived yet. Amy surprised. No, oh. Crosses to Kitty. Kitty? Mr. Wickham's aunt hasn't come yet. Kitty rising. Hasn't come? Crossing to centre. Oh. Turning to Jack. Then we must... We'll run and do some shopping and come back. Shan't be long. Goodbye. Kitty crosses Amy to left entrance. Charlie has worked round to door, which he opens. Jack follows. Amy to Jack. Goodbye. Goodbye. Kitty to Charlie at door. Goodbye. Amy to Charlie at door, rather sadly. Goodbye. Exit left, Kitty first, then Amy. Charlie at door. Goodbye. Slight pause. Jack and Charlie look at each other blankly, 
both sit on centre table and shake hands see that off like a shot when they found your aunt wasn't here makes an awful difference doesn't it jack hurrying charlie off left now look here you cut off to the station and bundle the old girl here in a fly charlie picks up his hat from table charlie turning at door the old girl what do you mean well your aunt and i'll see after the lunch and keep an eye on babs charlie going all right i returning i say jack i feel happier since i've seen them don't you jack impatiently yes be off going towards writing table exit charlie left enter lord fancourt in shirt sleeves and waistcoat up left comes down left of jack cautiously jack turns and sees lord fancourt i say old oh, chap have you got any hairpins enter brasset up left coming down to sideboard hairpins great scott no may i send your man for some yes certainly lord fancourt aside to jack i say have you got sixpence jack feeling hurriedly and impatiently in pockets no afraid not why you haven't got anything aside to brasset i say brasset i give you half a crown just now do you mind making it two shillings and getting me sixpenny worth of hairpins brasset with a look certainly my lord you can keep the change exit brasset left i say jack were those the girls yes but what the deuce made you jump out like that they might have seen you i didn't know they were here off stage knock at outer door left look out there's somebody else lord fancourt bolts and exits door up left by george there was a lot of hope in what kitty said in another minute i'd have told her that i going to table right back turn to door left but never mind everything's going on splendidly knock repeated come in enter sir francis chesney left colonel sir francis chesney baronet late indian service tall good-looking smart in appearance and manner wears small military moustache actually fifty-one but looking nearer forty very smart cheery and young in manner wears brown lounge suit bowler hat and carries gloves and malacca walking stick he has just arrived from london jack jack turning surprised and delighted dad my dear boy they shake hands dear old dad what brings you here wherever have you come from from town my lad to have a chat with you and to bring you your check puts hat stick and gloves on sideboard thanks dad you're a brick sir francis smiling a bit overbaked my boy after all my years in india coming centre below table a bit crisped dad but a humbug pictorially am i how do you make that out how old are you what do you say to fifty fifty one who'd believe it and you jack seem much older than i was at your age i suppose it's the times even the old college shows it new ivy new paint looking towards window both centre backs to audience looking at college through window alma mater's an old beauty still dad they turn facing audience again i suppose she is by aid of the gentle artifices of the toilet cheerfully and unconcernedly well we all grow old sits on centre table sir francis takes out pocket-book containing cheque already made out to jack and a bundle of bills pinned together with one very long one among them and as presentably as possible why dear old dad even you at fifty one fifty years ago would have been a stout white-haired or bald-topped booted domineering old boy and instead here you are a smart bang up-to-date sort of chap one can talk to like a chum now how have you done it i don't know do you drink all i want eat well never noticed there you are consequently health good temper perfect we're going to be great pals dad sir francis handing check here you are my boy there's your check to go on with gives check looking at bills thanks dad sees amount of check 
smiles to Sir Francis. I haven't seen half enough of you. Sir Francis, holding up bills. I see your hospitality. I hope, Dad. And <laughs> Never mind, same when I was a lad. Jack, looking at Long Bill. I've been done over that wine monstrously. Were you? Never mind, so was I. They laugh. Sir Francis rises. They both move towards table right. Done over everything monstrously at college. But settle up, settle up. Jack back of table. Sir Francis left of it. I'm very satisfied with you. It's something to go down from college with a record like yours. Picks up cigar box and opens it. I say, my boy, where the deuce did you get these cigars? Jack, casually. Those, Dad? Sir Francis, putting box down, sits left by writing table. Ah, that accounts for the bills. And now, my lad, we must begin to think. Jack sits at writing table. Think? Now that I have come into the family title, as you know, I have also, which you don't know, come into the family debts and difficulties. Debts? Which are far more than I expected, with the result that all the money I've been saving for you in India goes to pay them. And in short, Jack, you and I, for the next few years, will be, comparatively speaking, poor men. Jack rises and crosses behind desk to center. Poor men. Aside. This settles me with old spectacle. Sir Francis, rising. However, I am in hopes of a small appointment for you. Jack turns, hopefully. In Bengal. Goes to fireplace. Re-enter Brasset, left. Bengal, what a horrible place. Turns, sees Brasset as he passes up stage left. To him, irritably. What is it, Brasset? Brasset, holding up by a fine string loop, a tiny brown paper packet, aside to Jack. His lordship's hairpins, sir. Confound his hairpins! Brasset exits up left. Aside, recollecting. By George, the dad'll be an odd one. I must get rid of Bab somehow if the dad stays suddenly stays why not aloud dad i've an idea sir francis turns and comes center to jack couldn't this matter be settled by a wealthy marriage no that's the sort of thing i rather deprecate i don't think jack i'd uh, listen my chum that is charlie wycombe's aunt dona lucia dalvadores is coming here to lunch today She's a widow. Sir Francis, dubiously. A widow? And a millionaire. Sir Francis, more hopefully. And a millionaire? And a charming woman. No, Jack, I don't think I'd advise you to do a thing of this kind merely for the sake of money. No, not me, Dad, you. Me? You young rascal. Attempts to punch Jack. Jack dodges under his upraised arm to fireplace right. No, no, I shall never marry again. Goes towards sideboard. Jack bringing him back again by the arm. Dad, think it over. Where are your things? At the hotel. Don't be rash. Go and change. Make yourself look as nice as possible. Come back to lunch at one o'clock, and Dad, put a flower in your buttonhole. Charlie, shouting off excitedly. I say, Jack! Enter Charlie left, hurriedly with telegram. Almost runs into Sir Francis. Jack, introducing. Oh, Dad, Charlie Wycombe. Charlie, my father. Sir Francis shakes hands with Charlie. Glad to know you, my boy. Glad to know you. Jack to Sir Francis aside. Her nephew. Nice boy. You'll like him. Sir Francis to Charlie. <laughs> I thought it was the fire brigade. Charlie laughs, goes up left behind table to fireplace. Now don't forget, put a flower in your buttonhole. Takes years off a man, a flower in his buttonhole. Sir Francis, turning and taking hat, stick, and gloves from sideboard. No, Jack, you come and lunch with me at the mitre. At door left. Now don't be rash, Dad. See her first, see her first. Sir Francis, putting his hat on jauntily. 
All right, Jack, I'll have a look at her. Smiling. I'll have a look at her. Exit left. Jack to Charlie. Well, what is it? Charlie, excited and anxious, gives telegram. Read that. Jack reads. Important business don't expect me for a few days. Lucia Dalva Doris. Excitedly. No, she's not coming. But she must. Go. Wire. Telegraph. No use. There's no time. Goes up to window. But hang it. The girls won't remain without a chaperone. What are we to do? Can we ask the proctor's wife, old Mrs. Looks out of window. Jack, gloomily. Who'd sit and stare like an owl. Charlie turning to Jack. Uh, here they are. They're coming. Again looking out of window. Jack sitting on table center. What on earth are we to do? Lord Fancourt off up left. I say, Jack, come and look at me. Jack irritably turning up stage and going up left. What the deuce is it? Opens door, looks off, starts back a step in amazement. By George! Splendid! To Charlie. Charlie, come here quickly. Do you know what a pious fraud is? Charlie crosses to Jack up center. Charlie surprised and puzzled. Pious fraud? First cousin to a miracle. Pushes Charlie across him. Look. Charlie looks off up left. What is it? Babs, your aunt. Babs? Turning upon Jack. My aunt? It's the only one you've got, so you'll have to make the best of her. Pushes Charlie down to right, drops down left. Lord Fancourt, off. I say, look here. Enter Lord Fancourt, dressed as an old lady, in black satin, fichu, wig, cap, etc. Stands smiling. How's this? Then walks down left, smiling benignly. Charlie looks on in amazement. Jack with determined satisfaction. As laughter subsides, Jack speaks. Splendid. Loud knock, outer door, left. Lord Fancourt looking at door in a fright. Who's that? Offers to bolt. Jack seizing him by shoulders. The girls. Lord Fancourt looking at Jack. The girls? Charlie's aunt can't come. Can't she? I'll go and take these things off. Turns to bolt up left. Jack grabs him, assisted by Charlie. No, they won't stop if you do. Won't stop? What do you mean? You must be Charlie's aunt. Lord Fancourt in dismay. Me? No. Charlie seizes Lord Fancourt by right arm, Jack holding his left arm. Lord Fancourt backs a little and sinks down. They then slide him across to chair left of writing table. Lord Fancourt rises twice and each time is pushed down again by Charlie, who then gives chair a kick backwards with the heel of his right foot, careful to kick chair while it appears to audience as if he had kicked Lord Fancourt, who writhes. Jack leaves him and goes to meet girls. Charlie stands left of the chair so as to hide Lord Fancourt from door left. Brasset enters up left. Show them in, Brasset. Brasset opens door left. Enter Kitty and Amy, carrying bunch of flowers and tissue paper. Jack joins them. Lord Fancourt makes an arch of Charlie's right arm and looks through it to see what girls are like, much to Charlie's annoyance. Charlie, furious, smacks Lord Fancourt's face. He actually hits own arm. Lord Fancourt draws back as though his face had been hit, clamping his hand over his nose and mouth. Ah, you've got back. So glad. Brasset exits up left. Yes, we've been longer than we intended, but I wanted to get some flowers for Charlie's aunt. Has she come? Yes. Has she? I hope she's come. Oh, yes, she's come. Jack crosses right center. Kitty and Amy follow. Charlie moves up to clear Lord Fancourt. Jack introducing. Donna Luzia, Miss Pettigrew, Miss Verdun. Girls, Donna Luzia Dalvadores, Charlie's aunt. Charlie moves up right a little. Jack crosses rapidly behind Lord Fancourt, stands right of him. Slight pause. Jack aside to Lord Fancourt. Go on, say something. Lord Fancourt stares at them blankly, and, after a pat, How do you do, my dears? 
We called upon you before, Donna Lucia, but you hadn't arrived. Amy, crossing Kitty, goes to Lord Fancourt and giving flowers. And we've brought you these. Lord Fancourt taking flowers. Oh, thank you. Amy joins Charlie. They move upright. I hope your journey from town hasn't tired you. Oh, no. It was very jolly. Jack prods him. Pleasant, I mean. Kitty goes up to Amy and Charlie. Lord Fancourt aside to Jack, holding up flowers. What the deuce am I to do with these things? Jack aside to Lord Fancourt. Stick em in your dress. Fancourt puts flowers in dress, tries to see over them, can't, so parts them and peers between. Brasset enters, comes down centre to speak to Lord Fancourt, sees flowers, can't speak. Lord Fancourt winks at him. Brasset nearly explodes and turns to sideboard hurriedly. Amy, at back of table, to Charlie. You look worried, Mr. Wickham. Are you ill? No, I am anxious. I am... Jack, coming to the rescue. He's a little affected at meeting his aunt today for the first time. Aside to Lord Fancourt, prodding him. Why the dickens don't you say something? What the dickens am I to say? Talk about the weather. Lord Fancourt aloud to girls. Charming weather? Oh, yes, delightful. Oh, oh yes, yes, it is it charming. Is charming. Brasset at door left. Well, college gents'll do anything. Brasset exits. Lord Fancourt aside to Jack. You know, you're placing me in a terribly false position. Amy, coming down right to Lord Fancourt. May I arrange these for you, Donna Lucia? Lord Fancourt takes flowers out of dress and hands her them. After all, you know, we have some nice weather sometimes in poor old England. Turns to Charlie, then joins Kitty at centre table. Charlie then goes left of Lord Fancourt. Lord Fancourt aside to Jack. What on earth does she mean by that? Why, you're a foreigner. A foreigner? What did you say my name was? Donna Lucia Dalvadores. What am I? Irish? No, English. Married a Portuguese abroad. A widow. From Brazil. And a millionaire. Lord Fancourt to Charlie. I say, Charlie, have I any children? No, you fool. Charlie kicks chair as before. Lord Fancourt hurriedly rubs leg as though hurt. Brasset enters with tray, places it on center table, arranges the luncheon things, standing below table, back to audience. Kitty and Amy help during following scene. Brasset also arranges three single chairs, two behind one end of table left. Well, one ought to know. That's all right. Now I can go on ahead. Yes, it is wonderful weather for England. Yes, it is. Yes. Lord Fancourt aside to Jack, rising. Shall I take them to see the chapel in the cloisters? Jack and Charlie pull him back violently in the chair. No, you leave that to me and Charlie. We'll attend to them. Kitty, coming down left of table to Lord Fancourt. Of course, Oxford is all very new to you, Donna Lucia, but it's a dear old place in any weather. Amy and I will show you all about. I shall be delighted. Rises. They push him back as before. Kitty to Lord Fancourt again. You're staying till tomorrow, are you not? Lord Fancourt aside to Jack. Am I staying until tomorrow? Jack quickly and rather loudly. No. Lord Fancourt quickly and very loudly. No. The girls turn round in surprise. Oh. Returns to left of table, helps to lay lunch. Oh, but you will, you must. To Kitty. Mustn't she, Kitty? Charlie anxiously. I am afraid Auntie can't stay after today. Kitty joins Amy up center. No, you see, it's my washing day. Crosses legs. Charlie, who is standing left of him, pushes Lord Fancourt's knee down again. Charlie to girls, explaining. She has so much business to attend to in town. Joins girls. Yes, lawyers, stocks. Yes, stocks and socks. Jack punches him. Oh, very important, you know. Amy comes down left of Lord Fancourt. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. We have so longed to know you. Have you, my dear? Takes Amy's hand. Mr. Wickham has told us so much about you that he has made us quite love you. Kitty sits right corner of window seat. Charlie comes down behind Amy. Lord Fancourt slipping his left arm round Amy's waist. Has he, my dear? Charlie takes Lord Fancourt's arm away angrily. Lord Fancourt replaces it. Charlie pulls it away again. Amy kneels. Lord Fancourt slips his arm round her shoulders and gives her a quick little hug, and both the boys a look of triumph. Charlie, furious, crosses to left. Goes up, knocks off cap from figure, returns down left and sulks. Amy, kneeling by Lord Fancourt. And he's so grateful. He says he owes everything to you and never could repay you and... Oh, he is such a good, frank, upright man. It was noble of you. Of course, my dear. Taking his arm from round her quietly. It was only my duty to see after the welfare of my poor brothers. Jack, aside to Lord Fancourt, quickly. Sisters, you fool, I... Lord Fancourt to Amy, repeating. Sisters, you fool. Correcting himself. <laughs> Sisters with aggressive look at Jack. And? To Amy. Brother-in-law's orphan girl. Jack, aside as before. Boy, boy. Lord Fancourt to Amy. Boy, boy. Aside to Jack. I'll say twins in a minute. Brassett, below table, back to audience, has during this scene been laying luncheon. Now exits left. Yes, but it was so good of you to find out. You were so far away in a foreign land, and you might have been left to starve or to fall into cruel hands. But you have a good, kind, affectionate nature. Have I, my dear? Anyone can see it in your face. No. I feel I could tell my whole heart to you. Looks away to Charlie, left. Jack to Lord Fancourt, aside. Don't let her. Lord Fancourt, aside to Jack. I'm not going to. The dear little thing. Amy to Lord Fancourt. You don't mind my talking to you like this, do you? My dear, you are a very charming little girl, of whom I am sure I could soon grow very fond. Looks over Amy's head at Charlie and waves. Charlie shakes fist at him. And you must tell me all you like some day when you know me better. Amy again looks away to Charlie left. Lord Fancourt aside to Jack. How the devil is that? Oh. Rises. I feel I've known you years and years already. Kisses Lord Fancourt and joins Kitty in window. Sits left corner. Charlie flies at Lord Fancourt, pinching him viciously. Jack, same business on other side. Then both join girls at window. Lord Fancourt aside. They're jealous. I'm very sorry, but it was very nice. Enter Brassett left, hurriedly to left center. Brassett to Jack, in an anxious manner, and half aside. Mr. Chesney, Mr. Chesney? Jack comes down to Brassett. I beg pardon, sir, but I heard Mr. Spedigue inquiring at the gate for your rooms, sir. Oh, oh dear. dear, my, my uncle, uncle back. back. Mr. Spedigue. All rise, general consternation. All remain above center table. Jack, aghast. Mr. Spettigue back? I thought he was in London. Returning to others above table. Brassett goes up left, draws curtains of recess. Mr. Chesney, I beg of you to send him away. Knock on outer door. Kitty, Amy, and Jack exit into recess. Brassett exits up left. Lord Fancourt looks scared at knock and bolts to window right. Leaps on to window seat, about to get out. Charlie turns bolts after him, seizes him round waist as he is getting through window, carries him down stage, Lord Fancourt's feet, with soles showing to audience, spread out. Charlie plumps him down right center, front. Lord Fancourt, in terror, grabbing Charlie. What am I to say? What am I to do? Stay where you are, Babs. Tell him what you like, only get rid of him. Charlie exits quickly through curtains into recess. Fancourt stands right center. Knock again, louder. Spedigue, off, in a loud and angry voice. Why doesn't somebody answer his door? 
Stephen Spedagu is a well-to-do solicitor of about fifty-six to sixty. Rather stout, and when not in a temper has a charming smile, so that in spite of everything you can't help liking him. He has real charm of manner when he likes to use it. At other times he is pompous, self-opinionated, assertive, and not open to argument. He is grey-haired, and can be rather bald, wears small short side-whiskers a la Sir Edward Clark, dressed in a frock-coat, grey cloth waistcoat, wearing top hat and carrying furled umbrella and gloves. This character should not be burlesqued. He is genuinely furious, but when he is charming he knows how to make that too seem genuine. Enter Spedagu angrily, with hat on, left, crossing to Lord Fancourt. Why doesn't somebody answer this door? Lord Fancourt, fixing him aggressively and backing him across stage to left, then suddenly to him, loudly. What do you want? I wish to see Mr. Chesney. Lord Fancourt pointing with closed fan. Where did you get that hat? Aggressively. Take it off, sir. Moving away a little to center. Spedagu removes hat, goes to table, and is about to sit chair left of table. Don't sit down, sir. Spedagu straightens hurriedly. I'm not sitting down. I didn't ask you to sit down. Spedagu coming down a little. We'll waive that for the present, ma'am. I wish to see Mr. Chesney at once. Well, you can't see him. He's not present. I am the only person present. But the porter told me that two young ladies, my niece and ward, were here. I tell you, I am the only young lady present. But he told me he saw them come in. Taps top of hat. And didn't he tell you he saw them go out? Taps hat twice with last two words with Fan. Spedagu loudly. No. Lord Fancourt just as loudly. Very well, then. What more do you want? They've gone into the garden. Turning upstage towards recess. Lord Fancourt turning with him. They've done nothing of the kind. Spedagu coming down left again. Then they've gone into the town. Going towards door left. Lord Fancourt coming down right. Well, why couldn't you think of that before? Crossing to Spedagu. And now, sir, having got all the information you are likely to get in your present condition. Eyeing him all over. Madam disgraceful where have you been moving way a little to centre spedagu following what do you mean madam i am annoyed but perfectly sober well you don't look it moving to side of writing table other people can be annoyed as well as yourself sits chair left of it and picks up timetable or other light book madam i apologize good morning puts his hat on turns and goes towards left as he turns to go lord fancourt half rises throws book knocks spedagu's hat off then sits again chair left of table assuming an unconscious air this business is done by spedagu putting his hat on lightly and slightly on one side lord fancourt holds a b c in flat of right hand and half propels it out of his hand with an upward movement catching the right side of hat and so sending the hat up stage Done otherwise at any other angle, there is a danger of the brim of the hat hitting Spedagu's nose. Retrieves hat, pointing to it. Did you see anything strike that hat? I beg your pardon? Did you see anything strike that hat? Putting hat closer to him. Lord Fancourt aside. He wants me to do it again. Strikes hat with fan. Spedagu puts on hat and exits left angrily. Going up right towards recess, calling to girls. Oh, my dears. Re-enter Kitty and Amy, followed by Jack and Charlie. Kitty to Lord Fancourt. It was sweet of you. You darling! One on each side of Lord Fancourt, they kiss him. Look at him, Jack. I'll punch his head in if he does it again. Knock. Brassett enters, up left. To Charlie. Here's my father. Going down centre to Lord Fancourt. Dona Lucia. Lord Fancourt comes down centre to Jack. Charlie joins girls up right centre. Aside to Lord Fancourt. Take care. He is my father. Look here. Am I any relation to him? No, you're Charlie's aunt. 
from Brazil. Brazil? Where's that? You know, uh, where the nuts come from. Lord Fancourt is hurried on to chair left of writing table. Charlie goes down left of Lord Fancourt, screening him from door as before. Jack center. Brasset opens door left for Sir Francis Chesney and waits to take his hat and stick. Enter Sir Francis Chesney. He has changed into frock coat, silk hat, stick, and carries gloves, and wears a deep cerise red carnation. Kitty and Amy up right center. Jack introducing to Kitty. Miss Verdun, my father. Delighted. Jack to Amy. Miss Pettigrew, my father. Kitty and Amy bow. Charmed. Turns, sees Brasset. Brasset takes his hat and stick and places them on hat rack in recess. Exits. To Brasset. Thank you. Aside to Jack. Now, Jack, has she come? Oh, yes, she's come. Crossing to Charlie. Aside. Go on, Charlie. Introduce your aunt. Charlie to Lord Fancourt. Donna Lucia Delvadores, Sir Francis Chasney, Jack's father. Sir Francis stares at Lord Fancourt. How do you do, Sir Francis? How do you do? I'm Charlie's aunt from Brazil. Uh, where the nuts come from? Charlie gets before chair and kicks as before. Goes up stage and joins ladies in window. Lord Fancourt holds his leg in pain. Sir Francis aside to Jack. I say, Jack. Jack goes quickly to him. Yes. Is that the lady? Eh, uh, yes. Sir Francis points to flower in his buttonhole. Oh, by George. Turns towards door left. Jack catching his arm to stop him. Oh, don't go, Dad. Then crosses rapidly to Lord Fancourt. Aside hurriedly. Go on. Charlie's told you all about him. Goes right of Lord Fancourt. Lord Fancourt repeating like a parrot to Sir Francis. Charlie's told you all about him. No, no. Lord Fancourt to Sir Francis. No, no. Jack whispering and prompting him. My nephew Charles. My nephew Charles has told me so much about you. Jack with a prod, aside. In his letters. In his letters. In his letters. Aside to Jack. That's all right, isn't it? Jack viciously. No, it isn't. Do it yourself. Looks sulky. Jack moves left of Lord Fancourt. I'm much obliged to Mr. Wycam, but I only met him today for the first time. Jack aside to Lord Fancourt. See? Aloud to Sir Francis. Yes, but, Dad, I've been simply photographing you to Charlie for years. Lord Fancourt to Sir Francis, brightening. Oh, yes. He's a splendid photographer. Jack aside to Lord Fancourt. Remember, you've only just come to England, and you've never seen Charlie till today. Why the deuce didn't you say so before? Re-enter Brasset from recess. Jack. Jack comes quickly to Sir Francis. Aside to Jack. My dear boy, it's impossible. What, Dad? Sir Francis with a look towards Lord Fancourt. Well, look at her. Eh? Suddenly remembering his suggestion of marriage. Oh, good gracious. Luncheon is ready, sir. Takes dish cover to sideboard. Charlie brings Amy and Kitty to luncheon table center. Amy left. Charlie stands left, upper corner of center table. Kitty top left. Jack, crossing to Lord Fancourt, aside. Uh, take my father and be careful how you talk to him. To Sir Francis. Dad, will you take Donna Luzia? Goes top right corner of table, taking chair from right end. Sir Francis, offering arm to Lord Fancourt. Allow me, Donna Luzia. Lord Fancourt rises, takes Sir Francis's arm, and they move up to table. You'll sit beside me, won't you, Sir Francis? Sir Francis takes chair from left end of writing table, places it at right end of center table for Lord Fancourt, who sits. Brasset gets chair from below door left, places it below center table for Sir Francis. They all sit. I shall be delighted. Sits center, back to audience. You've uh, traveled a great deal, I suppose. Oh, yes. 
I have been a great traveller, Sir Francis. I came all the way from London only this morning. Brasset looking about for champagne through this scene. Charlie serving mayonnaise. Donna Lucia, aunt. Aunt! Jack prods him. Mayonnaise? Lord Fancourt, sweetly. Thank you. Miss Pettigrew? Yes, please. Miss Verdun? Please. Lord Fancourt to Sir Francis. What a pretty flower. Do you like it? Offers it. Will you accept it? Oh, thank you. Takes flower, holding it out. I'll have it stuffed. Puts it in dress. Jack, mayonnaise? To Brasset. Open the wine, Brasset. Kitty to Jack. You have very pleasant rooms here, Mr. Chesney. Brasset pours claret into Sir Francis's glass and returns to sideboard to watch result. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, they're awfully nice rooms, Mr. Chesney, I'm sure. Don't you think so, Sir Francis? Pleasanter today. With a look from Lord Fancourt to Amy. Than usual, I fancy. Donna Lucia, may I have the pleasure? Sips wine, puts glass down in disgust. Jack, my boy, where did you get this stuff? May I have a little water, please? Jack to Brasset. Open the champagne, Brasset. I... I can't find it, sir. Lord Fancourt laughing to himself. Jack rising. Can't find it? Do you know where it is, Charlie? Looking about room, under table, etc. No. Looking in recess. Jack sternly to Brasset. What's become of it? I thought it was in ice. Lord Fancourt, who has been laughing to himself, taps table with spoon. They all look at him. What is it? What is it you want? The champagne, Donna Luzia. What? Haven't you got any? Well, I thought she'd forget something, so I brought some with me in my bag. In my bag, Brasset. Jack punches Lord Fancourt. Brasset takes bag off chair up left and goes to sideboard and takes out champagne. Enter Spedigue left in a rage with hat on. Ugh. Amy, Kitty, Jack, and Charlie together all rise except Sir Francis. Spedigue, just inside door left, sees girls. So I was right after all, and that old fool of a woman told me they were not here. Lord Fancourt and girls come down right. Sir Francis rises, puts chair under table. Jack, taking the bull by the horns, coming forward. Jack offering his hand, gaily. Oh, Mr. Spettigue. Don't address me, sir. Jack falls back a little. Spettigue to girls. And this is the way you take advantage of my absence? Mr. Spettigue. Don't address me, sir. I have no wish to hold any converse with you. Charlie, coming down a little left of table between Jack and Spettigue. But won't you allow us to explain? Spedigue pointing to Jack. My business is with this young man, sir, and not with you. Lord Fancourt, right, coming forward a little. But you won't listen to either of them. Go away, madam, and don't interfere. Where did you get that hat? Take it off, sir. Spedigue takes off hat, turning. Jack coming forward again, to Spedigue. You forget yourself, sir. Sir Francis, center, with quiet tone of authority. Perhaps you will remember, sir, that ladies are present. Spedigue loftily. I disapprove of their presence and request them to return with me. We can discuss this matter on a more fitting occasion. Certainly. A most excellent suggestion. Let him call again. You're a very foolish old woman, and I must beg of you not to interfere. At door. Ladies, come. Kitty and Amy move forward reluctantly, but Lord Fancourt puts out his arms to bar the way, and they each take his arm instead. Sir, you cannot put such an affront upon Mr. Wycam's friends. I don't know them. I don't know them. Sir Francis to Charlie. Introduce me, Mr. Wycam. Charlie drops down stage a little. Mr. Spettigue? Sir Francis Chasney. Falls back. Spedigue barely acknowledges introduction. Mr. Chesney is my son, sir, and... Turning to Lord Fancourt. The lady is... Lord Fancourt standing between the two girls and affecting to be hurt. 
pray don't introduce him to me i have been sufficiently insulted by the old bowner gentlemen already i consult my own feelings when i say that i am deeply annoyed to find on prematurely returning from town my niece and my ward lunching without my permission with these two young gentlemen to meet mr wycam's aunt spedigue with insulting disbelief indeed i sir francis anger rising there is no indeed about it sir i repeat to meet mr wycam's aunt in my mind it matters little in my mind it matters everything therefore kitty and amy let go of lord fancourt's arms allow me to introduce you to lord fancourt dona lucia d'alvadores mr aside to jack uh, what's his confounded name jack spetigu spetigu aside dona lucia sir francis finishing introduction mr spetigu spetigu surprised aside the celebrated millionaire the boys see the change lord fancourt crossing to spetigu oh how do you do how do you do i am charlie arms from brazil <laughs> where the nuts come from jack pushes lord fancourt who falls against spetigu lord fancourt tries to turn the fall into an awkward curtsy then turns furiously to jack spetigu aside i've been indiscreet to lord fancourt oh i am sorry very very sorry charlie goes up round back of center table takes amy back to luncheon table she sits in same place again jack aside to lord fancourt go on he's apologized ask him to lunch jack takes kitty back to luncheon table same place lord fancourt to spedigue well i thought you were very rude but if you apologize you know spedigue quickly oh by all means i'm sorry i am very sorry you stay to lunch won't you brasset down left takes hat and stick from spedigue if you wish it and i am forgiven forgiven takes flower from dress yeah except this is a peace offering puts sir francis's flower into spedigue's coat orchestra starts playing curtain music very softly which swells to full volume as curtain falls sir francis indignantly my flower crosses to lord fancourt and spedigue charlie and amy jack and kitty seated as before sir francis offers left arm to lord fancourt allow me dona lucia no allow me offers right arm lord fancourt hesitates flutters eyelashes at them both then chooses spedigue's arm they go towards chair right end of table sir francis leaves them and goes up to chair right of table which he holds ready for lord fancourt spedigue offers to take chair from sir francis between the two the chair is drawn back and lord fancourt sits on floor the others rise with screams and exclamations tableau curtain end of act one part two